In a recent piece in the press, Debra Sanya, one of the girls who escaped her kidnappers in Nigeria, recounts what occurred the day she and over 300 of her classmates were taken away from their school and families by Boko Haram. In her own words, on the night of the abduction, militants showed up at the boarding school dressed in Nigerian military uniforms. They asked that they were there to take us to safety. They said, don't worry, nothing will happen to you. The men took food and other supplies from the school and then set the building on fire. They herded us into trucks and onto motorcycles. At first, we, while alarmed and nervous, believed that we were in safe hands. When the men started shooting their guns in the air and shouting, I realized that the men were not who they said they were. I started begging God for help. I watched several girls jump out of the truck that they were in. Sanya has said when it was able to escape the next day with two of her friends and found her way back to her village and family. And she said, I thought it was the end of my life. There were many of them. And as you know, because you're very familiar with the story, this is just one story from only a handful of girls that were able to escape. And as we know that some 200 girls still remain somewhere in the surrounding wilderness under Boko Haram's guns. And we are all here to find a way to make sure that these girls come back. Before I explain to you why I'm involved, I'd like to first of all thank Yasin. And he worked really hard to, to have make this happen and to all the organizers. And let's give them a big hand. <laughs> You know, I didn't expect anybody here today. It's beautiful outside. <laughs> and, you know, to, I'm used to going to places where there are very, very few people. But for me, it's not numbers. It's people who care, who come. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a joke that when I went first and went to Senate school, it doesn't exist. It's just a joke. I was told <laughs> that if five people came to an event, you can change the world. So we have a lot more than that. So I want to thank each one of you for being here because it's an issue that's so important. And you being here on such a beautiful day outside shows your commitment, and I thank you. I also want to recognize here uh, Khalil Jesse is sitting here in the front. Uh, Khalil is the person who um, has briefed me all the time. He and I work together, and so if you have any questions, ask Khalil. He will have a better answer than I will. <laughs> He's the one who does the work. I get the credit. <laughs> uh, I, I, want to, I want to tell you five reasons why I got involved in this issue. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not really, cannot really stand here and say I've made any difference. But I'm committed to to, to continuously raise this issue in Parliament with the Minister, with uh, the President Johnson, anywhere I can, the legislator, that's my role and I'm trying to do that. But the five reasons I'm involved is all my life I've been involved in issues of women's rights and at this point I would like you all to know that when Miss Barnes talks about her father, Emery Barnes, he was a great person and um, a great me mentor for me, and when Emery was made, was made a speaker, if you think now things are tough for black people, trust me, it was, he was he went, went he crossed a path that no one else had crossed, and he made he gave his whole life to the cause of equality, especially for black people, and to have you follow in his footsteps. I'm not an NDP person. You all know that I'm a liberal senator. But I can tell you that I will work for Congress because the change will happen. Change will happen when we have her in Parliament. When we have her at the table, doesn't matter where it is, at the moment she already is making a difference for us. But when we have voices like her at the table, that is when our voices will be heard. So I urge all of you here to make sure that we support constant, if for no other reason, uh, for the memory of my friend Emery Barnes. And so I thank, thank you very much. Thank you.
So that's why I've always been, and you know, memory was a great supporter of mine in women's rights. I'm also a child of Africa. I've seen firsthand what destruction can happen by a group like Boko Haram, and I'll describe that to you. And the reason I'm really, really concerned is the destruction is not short-term. It's long-term destruction. And I get many, many letters of people very angry with me as to why uh, do I care about girls, 200 girls so far away, because I'm a British Columbian senator. And I just respond to them. 43 years ago, I came as a refugee to this country. And I learned a lot of values from Canadians. And one of the values is that we don't stop at our borders. We do care about people around the world because we are one humanity. And I am not going to give up that lesson that I learned so many years ago. I said to you my one reason was that all my life I have been involved in women's rights. And it is very hard to say today that it's 89 days since the girls were kidnapped by Boko Haram. For 89 days, almost 300 mothers have sat in their homes thinking about and praying for their daughters. For 89 days, these mothers have gone out onto the street to beg the Nigerian government to do something to save their daughters. For 50 days, I'm very sad to tell you, and not that you don't know this, these mothers were even barred from protesting and threatened with arrest. For 30 days after their daughters were taken, they were called liars. They were told that their daughters were not taken. They were making it up. It was only when the social media took some action, suddenly people started paying attention. And so I say to all of you here, that if you think what you can do for me, and who are can be lot. I urge you that let us not forget that another cult leader, Oni, in East Africa, in Uganda, in Congo, the destruction he did, and knowing that the Boko Haram leader is also uh, a cult leader, I cannot for a minute think that it is any different. So although I personally do not have any information, as to what is happening to those girls, I can only imagine from what I know what has happened in another part of the region as to what is happening to these girls. And time is of essence. For those of you who are aware of what happened in East Africa and Uganda, what destruction he did and continues to now do in the Congo, he has, he has got away with it. And I truly, truly blame all the leaders in that area. And I cannot begin to tell you how many times I sat with John Garan, who was at the end Vice President of South Sudan, who promised me, said, we can pick up Kony in a day. We have to have the will. And I truly believe that Boko Haram can be stopped very quickly. But we have to put the people. And I don't believe, I don't believe that we are. We are not as focused. And Please forgive me because I'm not for a minute trying to compare what's happening in Calgary at the moment. It's not, it's not about that and what's happening. But if you see as Canadians the effort we are putting on the three people that have, uh, have disappeared, and we should put it. Imagine if we put that kind of effort into finding the 200 I truly believe in all the blame, We can find it good. The challenge is, do we have the will? The reason I, I didn't have a choice but get involved is because I have firsthand seen the destruction. And I hope and pray that it's not the same kind of thing that is happening to the girls that have been kidnapped by the Boko Haram. But what I saw, I want to share with you, and that is. The Boko Haram leadership is also a cult leadership, as was the liberation front the leadership. And we all know that the Boko Haram is a cult of young men, marginalized young men, who are disaffected and 
before they were being supported by local political leaders. They were being supported by governments in the northern area because there was this feeling that the South had forgotten the North. And even though we think of Nigeria as a very rich resource country, we do know that the, the resources are not shared equally. And obviously, because of that, and the absence of security forces in the North, Abu Bakr Shaku has been able to cause havoc in, in the North, and he will continue to do so. And it would be naive for us to think that he is not supported. He is supported by many people, uh, and he, he, he conducts a sort of Wahhabism Islam that is very destructive. It is not a Muslim, and I'm not proud of what he's doing. And he needs to be stopped. He needs to be stopped not just for the 300 or 200 uh, girls uh, and uh, young boys that he has abducted, but, but because of the destruction that he will continue to do. And that's why the reason that Cameroon, Benin, uh, Nigeria, and Chad came together, because Boko Haram exists in some kind of way all over. I was very much involved on behalf of the Canadian government to negotiate with the Liberation Resistance Army of Kony. And I can tell you that what I saw firsthand with what Kony was doing, I hope and pray that Abu Bakr is not doing half the things that Kony was doing, but it was absolutely destructive. So when I say to you I'm involved, because I've always been involved in women's rights, I'm a child of Africa, I've seen without destruction. It is absolutely horrible to see how the area around northern Uganda is not the same area that I grew up in. It is absolutely destroyed. Around Guru and northern Uganda, now in the Congo, some places in southern Sudan, one man, a cult man, cannot be doing this on his own. He obviously has support from the leaders around, because one man can be stopped. One man can be stopped, one man for the few people can be stopped if there is the will. The long-term effect of what Pony has done will always be with us in his life. That will never be. And let me share with you, and I encourage you to go and look at Evelyn Apoko, it's A-P-O-K-O, Evelyn A-P-O-K-O website. Evelyn is my young friend, she's a Ugandan girl, she's around 18 years old. At the age of nine, she was abducted by Tony. She was saying, you could write this story again, same way 200 girls from Guru were abducted. The same story that we are hearing in Nigeria. Nothing different. And you know, she was, became a sex slave. She walked. Read her story, because I don't have. She walked and walked. And the only thing I share with you is that when the Ugandan government was fighting for me, they dropped a bomb, and half her face was blown away. I'm not kidding you. Half her face was blown away. And her story is. Just to relate it, I won't get through it, but at the end, she has ended up here in the U.S. She's had almost 20 surgeries in different parts of uh, the U.S. whenever a hospital is able to do three surgeries. She's been there for four to five years, 18 surgeries on her face to restore her age. But Evelyn is a strong girl. But the destruction of Pony will go on for her. But the part that I want to leave why Boko Haram has to be stopped is a thing that I will never forget as long as I live. When I was your envoy and I went to the region in the and every night, every night, parents would send their five, six, seven, eight year olds out of the house and were called commuter children. They would be sent out to the house 
only way that I can think of it, when I was little, my mother used to put a tent outside. That's how the parents sent their children outside. And they walked and walked and walked and walked for hours every night to go to a safe place. Imagine being a parent of a child. Sending that child away to be in a stranger, who knows what has happened to that child during the night, to keep that child away from her mother. Those children can tell you such tales of what happened in this world when they were five or six years old. That's the destruction of home. I was in good. It blew my mind away when I saw young men with no legs. And Canada was building toilets to help these young people. Those of us who come from Africa know that it's a challenge when you're handicapped. And I was so annoyed. Our focus as Canadians was on building a toilet rather than giving the technology to deal with Pony. I, I delivered a satellite to Pony so we could deal with number station. A satellite from and if we believe in the equality, if this is really our value, then we cannot forget those 200 girls. Because it's not about just those 200 girls. It's about the destruction of the communities from which they have been taken. So what best Canadians can we do? I believe that each one of you, I urge you, I beg you to go home today and write a letter to our Prime Minister. Say we have this meeting. Say that you're concerned. Ask him what is he personally doing to bring back the world. Trust me, he does have pressure. And if each one of you, or even half of you, wrote a letter, it would make a difference. Write, as Yassin said, to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. You don't need to write a long letter. A very short letter, and you don't even have to put a stamp. And then also write to the High Commissioner for those of you who come from Nigeria as Nigerians and demand <coughs> to know what the Nigerian, I can't tell you how many letters I've written to the High Commissioner yeah. and to the President of Nigeria. None of them have responded. That, that doesn't mean anything. You know, when I first went to the Senate, I was told that if you get five letters on an issue, there's a revolt on the ground. I'm not kidding you. Five letters. That was because before the era of email. So when I get these bulk emails, I don't worry about that. But if I get five letters handwritten, I worry about the issue. Because I know people care. So imagine if each one of you took the time, given up your whole afternoon, take the time to write the letters. And you will think, what difference? Will a letter made. We as Canadians have a right to demand of our government to put priorities that matter to us as Canadians. You all have given up your afternoon because this issue matters to you. You care about this issue. And, if you, and I have no doubt that you do. If you care, take the next step and ask our Prime Minister, ask our Minister of Foreign Affairs. What are they doing? And then after this, I will be available at any time you want to meet. Let's see if we get a response from the meeting next. Eighty-nine days have passed. I dread it when it will be 150 days. And I want to say to each one of you that if we believe as Canadians that all children next we have to ask ourselves why. Many people who have heard me have heard me say this before, so I'm repeating myself. We want children, we want people to be treated equally because we believe in harmony of society. We believe that it is really important that we, all children, get the same opportunity. And what does harmony mean? You know, when I was young, my mother wanted me to be a pianist. And my father wanted me to be a politician. And he kept 
who went out. <laughs> My mother used to always tell me, practice, practice, practice. So to make her angry, sometimes I would say only on the way to keep. Try it. It's not good for me. Sometimes I would say only on the black key. Try it. It's not good for me. To have real harmony in society, black and white children should be. Thank you very much.